Okay, we will now go through the uh, paper 2 of uh, Swiss Cottage Prelim 2014. So the paper 2 of uh, this year's uh, 2014 Prelim is actually quite simple for paper 2. Uh, most of it is definitions. Okay, so uh, I will just uh, point out the things to take note of and uh, you can get the answer from the answer key. If not, you can just pause the video and uh, look at the answers directly. So for question 1, 1A is pretty straightforward. Uh, 1B part 1 uh, is also quite straightforward. Uh, as long as you know that the gradient of a VT graph actually represents the acceleration, you can uh, answer the whole of this question. Now one point to take note is whenever you are answering this kind of question, if you see there are values okay, given in the graph, you have to mention them uh, in your answer. So for this case, let's say for B part 1, if you just mentioned that the ball is accelerating uniformly, but you didn't mention that it is from 0 to 5 meter per second, it is uh, not so complete. So it's best to include uh, some parameters that you uh, manage to capture from the graph. Okay, for part 2, uh, uh, most of the common mistake is that student would uh, write the word uniformly acceleration as well because if you look at uh, the graph here these two lines are actually in parallel they are both having positive gradient so a common mistake is that student may interpret the gradient in BC as an other uniform acceleration but if you understand the context of this question you can see that at the beginning of time the ball is gaining speed as it falls to the ground then when it hit the floor at this point it changes the direction of its motion because it will rebound from the floor so that's why the velocity factor is no longer pointing down so from zero it is falling down falling down falling down falling down until this point it rebound so instead of falling down it actually bounces up so that's why the signage here is no longer positive 5 but it's actually negative 5 because it changes direction so from negative 5 it goes up right so it goes up but because gravity is pulling it down so it will be minus 5 minus 4 minus 3 minus 2 all the way until 0 when it reaches the maximum height so if you understand this context right actually from b to c is not really an acceleration because when you say acceleration it implies an increase of speed but down here from B to C is actually from the first instance where it changes direction and rebounds up and it gets slowed down by the gravity so from minus 4 change to minus 4 minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 okay so in this case it is not an acceleration but it's actually a deceleration so in this case for your B part 2 you have to mention that this is decelerate decelerates uniformly from minus 5 meter per second to 0 okay so this is one of the common mistakes uh, then after that in part C they ask you to describe just the displacement so whatever that you are explaining you have to explain it from the point of view of displacement okay so if you look at this you should start off with the noun displacement is it increasing or de decreasing so of course in this case you are this displacement is measured with respect to this uh, motion sensor okay so from B to C the ball is actually B is actually at the floor and then it bounces up so of course at the beginning it will be maximum displacement and the displacement is going to slowly decrease as it approaches the motion sensor okay so that's why you have displacement decreases from point B to C okay and then you have to also mention that is it at uniform rate decreasing or increasing rate so as you understand from this graph okay the speed is actually decreasing as gravity is slowing it down so that's why your displacement will decrease at a decreasing rate okay so that is for your question one. Oh, sorry there is a part B also so for part B uh, they ask you for two assumptions actually there can be quite a lot of different assumptions so uh, what they are saying is that this graph here is actually uh, a theoretical graph okay 
So what you can see is that when the ball falls down, it actually undergoes a uniform acceleration and this will not happen in real life because in real life, uh, there will be air resistance. So air resistance is not a constant force. It actually uh, changes with the speed at which your ball is falling. So if that is the case, you won't get a uniform acceleration. So this is one of the assumptions. Now the second assumption is that uh, you can see that the area underneath this uh, line and the area underneath this line is almost equal. Uh, this means that the ball actually bounces up from B and reaches back to the sensor. Now uh, I'm sure you have the experience of uh, dropping a ping pong ball and all that. You won't get the ball to bounce up to the same height because some energy is lost through the collision uh, to the floor. So the other assumption is that there is no energy loss. Uh, that's why the ball will come back to the uh, original displacement, uh, original height. Okay, so that's it for your uh, question one. Okay, this is question two. Question two is quite simple. You have basically a pole uh, being uh, held down by two ropes. This one on the left and this one on the right. Now the thing is that they didn't tell you any information uh, regarding the rope on the right. You do not know the tension, you do not know the direction. But in the passage, they tell you that there's a resultant force acting vertically downward and they give you the magnitude of 200 Newton. So the first thing about doing a factor diagram is that you have to establish the scale. So in this case, since your largest force is 200 Newton, a good scale could be 1 cm is to 20 Newton. Okay, so this uh, vertical downward force will be about 10 cm and it is actually quite big already. So let us look at how to draw this. So first thing you can uh, uh, start drawing the resultant force because it is vertical. So uh, vertical lines are easier to draw. So once you do that, just draw the vertical line 10 cm. Okay, uh, I'm going to zoom it in. Okay, so it's 10 cm. So usually I put a dot here uh, and a dot here. Then after that, uh, because it is a resultant force, so double arrow, uh, write down the magnitude of the force. Okay, secondly, you were told that there is this 100 Newton uh, force uh, acting at 60 degree. So what you need to do is that from here, just measure 60 degrees. So I know it is somewhere around here. Uh, what I usually do is that before measuring, I just uh, just uh, make a guideline. So I know that to this direction, this is 60 degree. Uh, so it is 100 Newton. 100 Newton on our scale would be um, 5 cm. So this is 5 cm. So draw this line. Uh, I'm going to use the uh, tail to head method. So if you look at this, this is the tail, this is the head. In order to produce this resultant force, this means that I will definitely need another force factor that is going this way. So tail to head, tail to head. So this red color arrow would be my tension. So what I need to do is that I need to measure its length. Its length is about nine, uh, 8.7. So 8.7 uh, cm would be, um, where's my calculator? 0.7 times 20. This will be uh, 174 Newton. So I write it down here, 174 Newton. Let's zoom it out. Okay. Uh, then I need to also indicate the direction. So direction is quite flexible, either you can uh, uh, make a reference from here or oh, you can directly measure I think, measure from the horizontal vertical. So, so this angle here is about 30 degrees, if you can see 30 degrees, so I know this is 30 degrees, that means that my force will be acting 
so this is an alternate angle right can you see it's a z so this will be 30 so you can see that this 174 uh, newton is uh, acting 30 degree from the vertical yeah that's it can okay question three is very simple basically it is a giveaway mark uh, what you need to be careful is what are the units that you are going to substitute into your equation uh, for a part one you are just asked to calculate the change in the gravitational potential energy so you can use mgh uh, just use mgh minus the mgh so what i do here is that i have factorized it so uh, you will get this answer Okay, when you want to calculate uh, the kinetic energy at 500 meter, you can actually get the information from the passage right here. 52 meter per second at uh, 500 meter. So just use half mv square, you will get uh, the answer in uh, A part 2. Okay, for part B, uh, you were asked to explain why is there a uh, difference in the values uh, calculated uh, why is it that the ke at 500m not equal to the change uh, the difference in the gpe uh, there could be a lot of reason uh, one of it is that uh, some of when when you drop from a height some of the gravitational potential energy is used as uh, sound energy uh, heat energy when you are rubbing against the uh, uh, air you will generate heat and uh, I think most significantly is that some of the energy is used as work done to overcome the air resistance so actually uh, in this question when you jump off the plane the PE will be converted into heat energy, sound energy the work done against the air resistance and of course change to the kinetic energy which gives you the speed okay um, okay then now for part C Okay, you are asked uh, why is the sky diver traveling at constant speed? So when you look at this, constant speed basically means that there's no acceleration. So in this case, it's best to use your Newton second law to explain. Don't just give a one word answer like uh, it has reached terminal velocity. Because that is just rephrasing the question. It won't earn you much credit. Okay, constant speed. That is the meaning of terminal velocity. Okay, the question wants you to explain why does the skydiver reaches terminal velocity. So explain it in terms of Newton's second law that uh, the downward acting gravitational pull is equal to the upward acting air resistance. So therefore, the net force is now zero. So by F equals to MA, when F net is zero, then A acceleration must also be zero. Okay? Okay, now we will look at uh, question 4. Question 4 uh, tests you on your knowledge of uh, phase changes and your kinetic theory. Okay, so for your A part 1, you are asked to describe what happens in uh, during evaporation. Uh, some things to take note is that evaporation only occur near the surface. So do write down this keyword, the molecules near the surface gains the energy. Okay, until it is uh, having enough energy to overcome the intermolecular force of attraction. Now, uh, it is not interatomic. Eh? Interatomic is another thing. So, what you are overcoming is just the intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so these are the two key points to take note. Uh, next, you are asked to explain why these uh, puddles of water evaporate faster. So, just from the diagram, you can see that the puddle here is having a larger surface area. It means that uh, that is because evaporation only occur at the surface okay so uh, obviously if you have larger surface area then uh, the frequency of evaporation occur the rate of evaporation occurring would be faster uh, in the puddle okay so just explain that okay part b is quite interesting uh, Although it is just two point, uh, I would like to encourage you to be systematic when you are explaining this. So how to be systematic? So number one, uh, you have to address every 
uh, features in this diagram. Uh, so this uh, system has the bowl filled with water and the dam cloth. So you need to explain all the features, not just the dam cloth. So what is the use of this water is to always keep this cloth damp. So you have to man uh, mention that in your answer. And because this cloth is always damp, evaporation will be occurring continuously until the water here is drained off. Okay, and you need to explain also that this cloth actually increased the surface area. So that's why the rate of evaporation is high. And lastly, you have to also mention that uh, evaporation would cause a cooling effect. So your answer is complete. Okay, question 5 is again a giveaway. Uh, 5A, you just need to study your spectrum. 5B is a uh, very simple V equals to F lambda. Substitute everything correctly, you should be able to get the answer. Okay, I'm going to uh, move on to 6 as well. Okay, 6, uh, although it looks quite complicated, actually it is quite simple. Uh, part A, part A is a giveaway uh, because the light is traveling from a less dense, less optically dense medium to an optically denser medium. You can uh, use the N equals to sine I over sine R formula directly and uh, just be careful your calculator is in degree mode and you should be able to get the answer. Okay, then uh, in part B, basically they are asking why is this ray uh, straight when it enters into the glass medium? So one common mistake here is that students tend to see the angle of incidence as 90 like this. So please remember that the angle of incidence is between the normal and the ray. So when you draw the normal, the normal is actually perpendicular to the boundary. So this is the boundary. Okay, separating air and glass. So therefore, your normal is actually um, here. I'm not sure you can see it, along the line DE. So when you are explaining your answer in part B, please be careful. The angle of incidence is actually 0, not 90. Okay, so if you use your formula, Snell's Law, you will get the angle of refraction as 0 as well. So therefore, the light ray will not bend at all. For part C, again giveaway mark, uh, just use the equation n equals to i over sine c, you will be able to get the critical angle of 41.5 degree. Okay, then for part D, they ask you to draw the refracted ray at point F and R. So uh, down here, because it is two mark, uh, please go and calculate uh, what is the refracted angle. So I'm not going to calculate it here, uh, because I think you can do it yourself. So uh, what I'll be focusing is uh, at this point R. So you are asked to continue the light ray. So if you look at the point R here, the angle of incidence is 42. And 42 is larger than your critical angle. Your critical angle is just like a property of this uh, prism. It's just like your refractive index. It's just a number. Okay, so if 42 is your incident angle, it is greater than this critical angle, that means total internal refraction will occur. So you need to draw the line here. So total internal refraction will occur. Uh, remember to measure it such that these two angles are the same. So for me, I will just sketch it. Okay, you guys, when you're doing the exam, you have to uh, really go and measure it to see if it is it, drawn to scale or not. Okay. So for point F, because it's entering a less dense medium, it's going to bend uh, towards, eh, bend uh, away, sorry, bend away from the normal. So bend away from the normal. Please go and calculate this angle. What is it? Okay, and uh, that should be all. Okay. Okay, for your question 7, is a bit more uh, lengthy, but it is manageable. Okay, number 1, you are asked to find out what is the polarity. So in this case, you can see the positive is going up, negative is pointing down, uh, I mean of the uh, battery. So use your right hand grip rule. You, curl, uh, you look at this, 
this this wire is going into the into the iron core, right? So if this pen is the iron core, the wire is wrapping around the iron core, and so the north is actually to the left. So what is here here will be your south pole. Okay. Uh, describe and explain any changes in the rotation of the motor if the resistance is increased. So explain it in step. Okay, and eventually you have to uh, relate it back to the changes in rotation. So don't don't just write something like oh resistance increase and therefore the rotation will decrease. Okay, you have to mention every intermediate steps. So say something like resistance increase, so therefore the current decrease. When the current decrease, so the magnetic field strength of uh, the iron core here, the magnetic field strength by this by this thing, and the magnetic field strength around these wires will be lower. And when the magnetic field strength lowers, then the force of interaction between these fields will be lower. So as a result, the rate of rotation in the same direction would decrease. Okay, it it is very uh, important. For you to show these uh, intermediate steps, okay, so that the marker will be convinced that you understand the cause and effect of this entire system, okay. Okay, uh, B part two, uh, the battery is replaced with an AC supply which is fifty hertz. Now the thing about this is that uh, if you change the polarity, that means uh, you need to check whether or not the direction of forces acting on each side would change or not. So when you are dealing with moto, you use your left hand rule. So down here this is my left hand. Okay, so this is the south pole. So forces, magnetic and current, right? So my magnetic will always be this way. Okay? This is this will this will be my force vector. So what happens if the polarity remains unchanged? It will be pos uh, positive to negative the current. And this is my pole when the supply is still like a DC supply. So the force acting on WX will be pointing up. Right? So now let's say I change this to an AC supply and therefore the polarity from this battery will flip. So instead of positive negative, it will be negative positive. Uh, positive negative, it will now be negative positive. So negative. So if this thing changes to negative positive, this is the iron bar. So now instead of wrapping it around uh, this way, I have to wrap it. Uh, I have to use the right hand. Sorry. So now uh, I want to determine the polarity of my uh, magnetic poles. So now it is switching the poles of the battery. So negative is on top, positive is below. So meaning that the current is actually flowing this way. Yeah? So if it's flowing this way, I have to grab my right hand this way so that these fingers represent how the current is flowing, right? It's flowing down. See? It's flowing down. Yeah? When the polarity switches. So now my north pole is on the right. So instead of south, when my battery switch poles, this will no longer be the south, it will be the north. So when I use my left hand rule, this is my magnetic field strength, right? It will be this way. Okay, and the way the current flow in WX, it will also switch. Because now I have flipped the pole of my battery, right? So just now it was going up. Now it is going down. So you notice that when you switch the pole of your supply, the magnetic pole will flip. The current at the direction of the current along WX will also switch, but the force is still acting up. Okay, so I summarize again. Huh? Before I switch the polarity of my supply, 
this will be my magnetic field because south is here and wx will have a current going up so therefore my force is up when i switch the polarity of my supply this will no longer be south it will be north so i have to change like that and wx the current will no longer be going up it will be going down so my hand will be like this so therefore my force is still up so with this understanding you see that even when the polarity of your supply alternates the force acting on wx will always be up so therefore when you use a uh, ac supply there will be no change to the uh, rotational direction okay and this is because when your uh, supply the poles of your supply switch direction both the magnetic polarity of the soft iron which is this and the direction of current flowing along this loop will switch direction oops sorry you can't see here so what I'm saying is that uh, when the supply alternates its direction this is going to change and the direction of current flowing in this coil is also going to change now when this happens the force acting on the side will still be in the same direction and therefore the rotation will be still in the same direction okay okay now uh, moving on to part C uh, advantage of using electromagnet is because it is variable okay permanent magnet you cannot change the strength but uh, electromagnet you can okay for your question 8 uh, this tests you on your knowledge about the Faraday's law and your lenses law and your generator uh, mechanism okay so for question 8 part A uh, please pay attention to this word only so when you are asked to explain blah 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 can only be you have to explain it from two points of view why is it that when it rotates it generate EMF and why is it that it does not rotate it does not generate induced EMF okay because of the word only here so uh, just mentioned that when the coil is rotating it experience a change in uh, the magnetic field strength from the permanent magnet so by Faraday's law an EMF is induced uh, please remember because of the word only here you have to add that However, if the coil is stationary, it will experience no change in magnetic field strength and therefore no induced EMF. Okay? Okay, I'm going to continue with part B. So part B, they ask you uh, at which position will give you the maximum induced EMF. So there are two approaches to understand this. Uh, I will go through both approaches. So the first approach is more mathematic. Now if you look at your right hand rule, you have your force factor here, your magnetic field factor here, and your current factor here. Now uh, actually, uh, your Faraday's law is represented by a factor equation. Okay, it is a cross product. So what cross product means is that when your factors are at 90 degree to each other, it will give you its maximum uh, so-called efficiency so uh, if you look at your coil okay I will put my camera here uh, the magnetic field line factor is horizontal and it will always remain horizontal now when the coil's plane is flat the, let's say this this hand is my coil plane it's going to rotate this way right so when when it is flat the force factor is actually pointing up because it's rotating this way. So only at the only at this position when the coin is flat, the force factor is pointing vertically up while the magnetic field line factor is horizontal. So when this happens, it forms a 90 degree. So because of that, the current produced will be the maximum. Therefore, at the horizontal position it will give you the maximum current okay now this is uh, one approach the second approach is more graphical so it is quite hard for me to it's very difficult for me to explain this 
if I'm looking at this at the top view. What I want you to imagine is I want you to put your eyes here. So what you'll be seeing is a side view. So I'm going to draw a side view here. Okay, I'm going to zoom a little bit into this. Okay, you have your north, you have your south, and so the magnetic field line will go this way. And then here it will go slightly bulge up. And this one will go slightly bulge up. Okay, I'm not going to draw uh, too many lines here to confuse you. So, if you're looking at it at the side view, uh, you are going to see the koi this way okay imagine this is the cross-sectional area of the wire so the wire actually goes in and then forms a coil so at the horizontal position you can see that uh, the wire in the coil is actually experiencing the strongest magnetic field lines because it is short and uh, of course there will be much more field lines you know uh, I cannot draw all but it at the horizontal position, the wire is going to experience uh, the most uh, magnetic field strength. Now, as this coil start to rotate, so let me draw out the rotation. So, so as it rotate, the new position will be somewhere here and somewhere here. So as it rotate, you can see that the wire here and the wire here is going to receive less magnetic field strength. Uh, it will experience less changes in the magnetic field compared to here where it will have the most dense magnetic field lines. So using this graphical approach, you can kind of deduce that at the horizontal position because it will experience a lot of uh, the magnetic field lines. Therefore, it produces uh, the strongest uh, induced EMF. So I'm just going to draw a little bit more. Okay, so you can see that at horizontal position, it has the it will experience the most change changes in uh, the magnetic field strength. As the coil start to rotate, okay, the coil is going to rotate this way. As it rotates, it will enter into a region whereby the magnetic field line is further apart, and so it will experience less change. So therefore, the induced EMF when the coil reaches this position will be less compared to here. Okay, so there you go, the two approaches. Okay, let's move on to the last part. Okay, for your part I, you are asked to determine the peak voltage and the frequency. What you need to do is uh, read very carefully what is uh, what does each division represents. Okay, so you can count. So here, if you want to read the peak voltage, is one box plus almost a half. So you can get this. Now, uh, the second part where you need to find the frequency, you have to first find the period first because the horizontal axis actually uh, represents the time base, not the frequency itself. So find the period first, then use your F equals to one over T to find the frequency, and uh, you should be able to get these two answer. Okay, for part two, now, when the rate of rotation is half, uh, basically, the coil will experience a slower change in the magnetic field strength. And because of that, the induced EMF will definitely decrease. So it is directly proportional. So when the rate of rotation is half, the amplitude of the voltage will also be half. Now, the, the other thing is that you have also connected a diode in series with the uh, resistor. So what a diode does is that it block off uh, the negative part of the current. So if you don't have a diode, when you rotate your generator, it will going to give you positive current, negative current, positive current, negative current. Okay, when you put a diode, basically anything that's negative, it will basically block it off. So that's why uh, in your uh, CRO, uh, normally without the diode, you will have the bottom part uh, like this you will have your bottom part. Okay, but with the diode, basically all your negative part 
will become zero. And so you only have this. Uh, please take note that your uh, EMF amplitude need to be half. Okay, but uh, the frequency, the period and all that should remain the same. So that's it for your paper one.